The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I wanted to spend an episode discussing enthusiasm and its role in wealth creation. The reason I bring this up, one of the 16 lessons in the Law of Success by Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich, one of the 16 lessons is enthusiasm. Recently, we discussed accurate thought, and I'm not going through the whole book one step at a time or with the entire book at the same time. I wanted to key in on some of the key messages within these lessons through a sort of summary or abridgment where I can read some passages to get an idea. Many of these lessons in the law of success are very long and repetitive and a little bit complicated based on the time that they were written, but deep within them are amazing lessons that are even more advanced than what you see or read in Think and Grow Rich. In the seventh lesson on enthusiasm, Napoleon Hill explains that enthusiasm is a state of mind that inspires and arouses one to put action into the task at hand. It does more than this. It is contagious and vitally affects not only the enthusiast, but all with whom he comes in contact. One of the key elements that we have been trying to create is the feeling of wealth so that we can project this feeling out into the quantum field and so that it could come back to us in the form of prosperity. And we're constantly striving to understand the state of wealth. We know that it involves gratitude. And another really key element is enthusiasm. In fact, it may be a prerequisite. And I ask you, do you know of anybody that's wealthy or successful that doesn't have some level of enthusiasm? I can't think of one. Every wealthy person I've ever met was enthusiastic. Now, that is just a word. Words have different meanings and interpretations. When I say enthusiastic, what does it mean? Well, we know from the definition here that it is a state of mind that inspires and arouses one to put action into the task at hand. It does more than this. It is contagious and it vitally affects not only the enthusiast, but all with whom he comes into contact. So you're becoming contagious with your energy and ideas. Enthusiasm bears the same relationship to a human being that steam does to the locomotive. It is the vital moving force that impels action. That tells you how old this book, this book was written when it was just steam powered drains. So the greatest leaders of men are those who know how to inspire enthusiasm in their followers. So you see movements of people in politics and groups and religious organizations and enthusiasm is the key element to the ones that are the most successful or consequential for that matter. It is the most important factor entering into salesmanship. It is by far, Hill says, the most vital factor that enters into public speaking. Nothing worse than watching a public speaker who is not enthusiastic, unless that's an act. And that's only a few comedians that can pull that off. So if you wish to understand the difference between a man who is enthusiastic and one who is not, Napoleon Hill gives an example of an evangelist at the time who was Billy Sunday. He says that his sermons were delivered at first without enthusiasm and they fell upon deaf ears because he wasn't enthusiastic. And he makes an observation that Sunday, Billy Sunday became enthusiastic and it changed his following. So mix enthusiasm with your work and it will not seem hard or monotonous. Enthusiasm will so energize your entire body that you can get along with less than half the usual amount of sleep. And at the same time, it will enable you to perform from two or three times as much work as you usually perform in a given period. So we're starting to get a picture that enthusiasm is an actual force or energy that we can tap into on a cosmic scale. When you understand what Napoleon Hill is secretly saying between the letters of this, 
is that enthusiasm is a word for a specific form of energy which compels you into action, which can lead to success and wealth. Hill explained that for many years he would do most of his writing at night. One night while he was enthusiastically at work over his typewriter, he looked out the window of his study just across the square from the Metropolitan Tower in New York City and saw what seemed to be the most peculiar reflection of the moon on the tower. It was of a silvery gray shade, such as he had never seen before. Upon closer inspection, he found that the reflection was that of the early morning sun and not that of the moon. It was daylight, and he had been working all night, but he was so engrossed in his work that the night had passed as though it were but an hour. Hill explained that he worked all night and day on his task, except for a small amount of food, and I've been there when I was painting, when I had started getting into painting and I would lose track of 18, 20 hours at a time. It didn't even cross my mind. Enthusiasm is a state of flow. It corresponds to other positive states. I think that gratitude leads to enthusiasm. In fact, Napoleon Hill states enthusiasm is not merely a figure of speech. It is a vital force that you can harness and use with profit. Without it, you would resemble an electric battery without electricity. Enthusiasm is a vital force with which you recharge your body and develop a dynamic personality. Some people are blessed with natural enthusiasm while others must acquire it. The procedure through which it may be developed is simple. It begins by doing of the work or rendering of the service which one likes best. If you should be so situated that you cannot conveniently engage in the work which you like best for the time being, then you can proceed along another line very effectively by adopting a definite chief aim that contemplates your engaging in that particular work at some future time. Here, Napoleon Hill, a hundred years ago, is telling you that you can imagine your future while you do this other job and you create a definite chief aim and you work towards it at some future time. He goes on to say that a lack of capital and many other circumstances over which you have no immediate control may force you to engage in work which you do not like. But no one can stop you from determining in your own mind what your definite chief aim in life shall be, nor can anyone stop you from planning ways and means for translating this aim into reality nor can anyone stop you from mixing enthusiasm with your plans. Happiness, the final object of all human effort, is a state of mind that can be maintained only through the hope of future achievement. Happiness lies always in the future and never in the past. The happy person is the one who dreams of heights of achievement that are yet unattained. The home you intend to own, the money you intend to earn, and place in the bank, the trip you intend to take when you can afford it, the position in life you intend to fill when you have prepared yourself, and the preparation itself, these are the things that produce happiness. Likewise, these are the materials out of which your definite chief aim is formed. These are the things over which you may become enthusiastic, no matter what your present station in life may be. More than 20 years ago, Napoleon Hill stated that he became enthusiastic over an idea when the idea first took form in his mind. He was unprepared to take even the first step toward its transformation into reality. But he nursed it in his mind, and he became enthusiastic over it as he looked ahead in his imagination and saw the time when he would be prepared to make it a reality. The idea was that he wanted to become the editor of a magazine based on the Golden Rule, through which he could inspire people to keep up courage and deal with one another squarely. A theme that he mentions throughout many of his books, including the final lesson of the law of success, which is the golden rule. Finally, his chance came, and he was given this job in 1918. With enthusiasm, he poured into that editorial the emotions which he had been developing in his heart over a period of more than 20 years. He says, my dream had come true. 
my editorship of a national magazine had become a reality. As I have stated, this editorial was written with enthusiasm. I took it to a man of my acquaintance, and with enthusiasm, I read it to him. The editorial ended in these words, At last, my 20-year-old dream is about to come true. It takes money, and a lot of it, to publish a national magazine, and I haven't the slightest idea where I'm going to get this essential factor, but this is worrying me not at all, because I know I am going to get it somewhere. As I wrote those lines, Hill claimed, I mixed enthusiasm and faith with them. I had hardly finished reading this editorial when the man to whom I read it, the first and only person to whom I had shown it, said, I can tell you where you're going to get the money, for I am going to supply it. And he did. Yes, enthusiasm is a vital force. Hill says it's so vital, in fact, that no man who has it highly developed can begin even to approximate his power of achievement. Before passing to the next step in this lesson, I wish to repeat and emphasize the fact that you may develop enthusiasm over your definite chief aim in life, no matter whether you're in position to achieve that purpose at this time or not. You may be a long way from realization of your definite chief aim, but if you will kindle the fire of enthusiasm in your heart and keep it burning before very long, the obstacles that now stand in the way of your attainment of that purpose will melt away as if by the force of magic and you will find yourself in possession of power that you did not know you possessed. Hill explains that your enthusiasm can affect others. We come now to the discussion of one of the most important subjects of this course, namely suggestion. In the preceding lessons we have discussed the subject of auto-suggestion, which is self-suggestion. Suggestion is the principle through which your words and your acts and even your state of mind influence others. Let me refer to the principle of telepathy. If you now understand and accept the principle of telepathy, the communication of thought from one mind to another without aid of signs, symbols, or sounds as a reality, you of course understand why enthusiasm is contagious and why it influences all within its radius. When your own mind is vibrating at a high rate because of it has been stimulated with enthusiasm, that vibration registers in the minds of all within its radius, and especially in the minds of those with whom you come in close contact. When a public speaker senses the feeling that his audience is in rapport with him, he merely recognizes the fact that his own enthusiasm has influenced the minds of his listeners until their minds are vibrating in harmony with his own. When the salesman senses the fact that the psychological movement for closing a sale has arrived, he merely feels the effect of his own enthusiasm as it influences the mind of his prospective buyer and places that mind in rapport, in harmony with his own. The subject of suggestion constitutes so vitally an important part of this lesson that I will now proceed to describe the three mediums through which it usually operates, namely what you say, what you do, and what you think. When you are enthusiastic over the goods you are selling or the services you are offering or the speech you are delivering, your state of mind becomes obvious to all who hear you by the tone of your voice. Whether you have ever thought of it in this way or not, it is the tone in which you make a statement more than it is the statement itself that carries conviction or fails to convince. No mere combination of words can ever take the place of a deep belief in a statement that is expressed with burning enthusiasm. Words are but devitalized sounds unless colored with feeling that is born of enthusiasm. Here the printed word fails me, for I can never express with mere type and paper the difference between words that fall from unemotional lips without the fire of enthusiasm back of them. And those which seem to pour forth from a heart that is bursting with eagerness or expression. The difference is there, however. Thus, what you say and the way in which you say it conveys a meaning that may be just the opposite to what is intended. This accounts for many a failure by the salesman who presents his arguments in words which seem logical enough 
but lack the coloring that can come only from enthusiasm that is born of sincerity and belief in the goods he is trying to sell. His words said one thing, but the tone of his voice suggested something entirely different. Therefore, no sale was made. That which you say is an important factor in the operation of the principle of suggestion, but not nearly so important as that which you do. Your acts will count for more than your words, and woe unto you if the two fail to harmonize. If a man preaches the golden rule as a sound rule of conduct, his words will fall upon deaf ears if he does not practice that which he preaches. The most effective sermon that any man can preach on the soundness of the golden rule is that which he preaches by suggestion when he applies this rule in his relationship with his fellow men. If a salesman of Ford automobiles drives up to his prospective purchaser in a Buick or some other make of car, all the arguments he can present in behalf of the Ford will be without effect. Once I went into one of the offices of the dictaphone company to look at a dictaphone dictating machine. The salesman in charge presented a logical argument as to the machine's merits, while the stenographer at his side was transcribing letters from a shorthand notebook. His arguments in favor of a dictating machine as compared with the old method of dictating to a stenographer did not impress me because his actions were not in harmony with his words. Your thoughts constitute the most important of the three ways in which you apply the principle of suggestion for the reason they control the tone of your words and to some extent at least your actions of your thoughts and your actions and your words harmonize. You are bound to influence those with whom you come in contact, more or less toward your way of thinking. We will now proceed to analyze the subject of suggestion and to show you exactly how to apply the principle upon which it operates. Before you can influence another person through suggestion, that person's mind must be in a state of neutrality. That is, it must be open and receptive to your method of suggestion. Right here is where most salesmen fail. They try to make a sale before the mind of the prospective buyer has been rendered receptive or neutralized. This is such a vital point in this lesson that I feel impelled to dwell upon it until there can be no doubt that you understand the principle that I am describing. When I say that a salesman must neutralize the mind of his prospective purchaser before a sale can be made, I mean that the prospective purchaser's mind must be credulous. A state of confidence must have been established and it is obvious that there can be no set rule for either establishing confidence or neutralizing the mind to a state of openness. Here the ingenuity of the salesman must supply that which cannot be set down as a hard and fast rule. Now at this point, Napoleon Hill goes through these letters and talks about service and suggestion, which are profoundly interesting. And I recommend that you read the entire lesson in the Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill. It's lesson seven on enthusiasm. But it's interesting that he spends so much time on suggestion as a key element to enthusiasm, basically stating that it's an element in which you can gain rapport on a telepathic level with people around you when you are enthusiastic. He also goes on to emphasize that character is the lodestone through which you are who you are and has enduring power, your reputation is important, emphasizing these things. He then says, you'll now be instructed as to how you shall proceed in developing enthusiasm in the event that you do not already possess this rare quality. The instructions will be simple, but you will be unfortunate if you discount their value on that account. First, if you have not already done so, write out your definite chief aim in clear, simple language and follow this by writing out the plan through which you intend to transform your aim into reality. And then secondly, read over the description of your definite chief aim each night. Just before retiring and as you read, see yourself in your imagination, in full possession of the object of your aim. Do this with full faith in your ability to transform your definite chief aim into reality. Read aloud with all the enthusiasm at your command emphasizing each word. Repeat this reading until the still small voice within you tells you that your purpose will be realized. He has this in italics. Repeat this reading 
until the small, still voice within you tells you that your purpose will be realized. Sometimes you will feel the effects of this voice from within the first time you read your definite chief aim, while at other times you may have to read it a dozen or 50 times before the assurance comes, but do not stop until you feel it. So please put in the comments if you've heard the voice tell you that your purpose will be realized. To all here, I would recommend the reading of the 7th and 8th verses of the 7th chapter and the 20th verse of the 17th chapter of St. Matthew. One of the greatest powers for good upon the face of the earth is faith. To this marvelous power may be traced miracles of the most astounding nature. It offers peace on earth to all who embrace it. Faith involves a principle that is so far-reaching in its effect that no man can say what are its limitations or if it has limitations. Write into the description of your definite chief aim a statement of the qualities that you intend to develop in yourself and the station in life that you intend to attain and have faith. As you read this description each night that you can transform this purpose into reality. Surely you cannot miss the suggestion contained. To become successful, you must be a person of action. Merely to know is not sufficient. It is necessary both to know and do. Enthusiasm is the mainspring of the mind which urges one to put knowledge into action. Enthusiasm is as essential to a salesman as water is to a duck. All successful sales managers understand the psychology of enthusiasm and make use of it in various ways as a practical means of helping their men produce more sales. Practically all sales organizations have get-together meetings at stated times for the purpose of revitalizing the minds of all members of the sales force and injecting the spirit of enthusiasm which can be best done en masse through group psychology. Sales meetings might properly be called revival meetings because their purpose is to revive interest and arouse enthusiasm which will enable the salesman to take up the fight with renewed ambition and energy. Now it's really interesting at this point in the chapter, and these are long chapters, Napoleon Hill talks about the psychology of good clothes, implying because it's in this chapter that you can establish enthusiasm through your clothes. And so you can dress in a certain level. Now, he says you don't need 31 suits, but he said, if I needed them, I would get them. I would find a way. And that it changes you internally, as well as the way that people interpret you externally. When you're wanting to reach a certain level of prosperity, you sort of dress ahead of yourself. And it pulls you into that reality is what he's implying that it does. Later in the chapter, closer to the end, Napoleon Hill says that some men rise to great heights of achievement as the result of love for some woman, which is what he talks about in Think and Grow Rich in sexual transmutation. And he makes a point that even underworld gangsters and robbery and burglars use cocaine and other narcotics to artificially stimulate enthusiasm for the things that they do. And then in big capital letters, he says, successful people have discovered ways and means which they believe best suited to their own needs to produce stimuli which cause them to rise to heights of endeavor above the ordinary. Check out my episode on the 10 mind stimuli in which I discuss Napoleon Hill's concept of the different stimulating factors in the mind. Very interesting paragraph. He says, One of the most successful writers in the world employs an orchestra of beautifully dressed young women who play for him while he writes, seated in a room that has been artistically decorated to suit his own taste, under lights that have been colored, tinted, and softened. These beautiful young ladies, dressed in handsome evening gowns, play his favorite music. To use his own words, I became drunk with enthusiasm under the influence of of this environment and rise to heights I never knew or feel on other occasions. It is then that I do my work. The thoughts pour in on me as if they were dictated by an unseen and unknown power. Napoleon Hill even claims he gained much of inspiration from music and art. And then once a week he would spend at least an hour 
in an art museum looking at the works of the masters and on these occasions again using his own words i get enough enthusiasm for one hour's visit in the museum of art to carry me for two days edgar Allan poe wrote the raven while reportedly intoxicated oscar wilde wrote the poems under the influence of some form of stimulus which cannot be appropriately mentioned in a course of this nature look at Jimi hendrix or the beatles they were all stimulated henry ford got his real start as the result of his love for his charming life companion these incidents are cited as evidence that men of outstanding achievement by accident or design discovered ways and means of stimulating themselves to a high state of enthusiasm So in the modern day, enthusiasm is a little bit different than it was 100 years ago, because this was written 104 years ago. Now you have enthusiasm that's not authentic. So you see people that seem enthusiastic, but it's not authentic. But at the same time, I'm, I reward them. When I see somebody that maybe appears to be fake, or inauthentically enthusiastic, good for them. I hope that when I'm in a state that's not enthusiastic, that I can put myself into a state that is enthusiastic. And I would suspect that if you act as if you're enthusiastic, that you'll become enthusiastic. There's definitely subtleties to this enthusiasm. You can be inordinately enthusiastic as a distortion, but in most cases, it is a part of the state of wealth. And I find the things I become enthusiastic about are deep hidden signals within me of my purpose and my energetic pattern that I'm moving into. So what makes you enthusiastic? Is there something that makes you enthusiastic? Perhaps that is a signal to you of something that you can move towards in your own path of prosperity. You can take his lessons and you gain enthusiasm as you begin to develop your definite chief aim. You can gain enthusiasm by changing what you wear. You can do quite a few things to develop this enthusiasm. And it affects others. It's very, very powerful when you're enthusiastic around other people. Because... Your suggestions resonate with them. And he goes into detail about sales. And I'm sure that you have encountered some really enthusiastic salesmen. And those are usually the best salesmen in my own experience. I mean, even terrible dictators and bad people from our past have shown enthusiasm, which they use to suggest large crowds of people. Just like the force, there's a good side and a bad side to the force. But if you just begin to develop an enthusiasm about the world around you and the things that interest you in your life, if you begin to figure this into the new character blueprint of who you want to be in the future. Because remember, we're all actors in this life. And if you were to go and research an acting role that you wanted to play, imagine that you're trying to get into that role then you would be enthusiastic if you were in a state of wealth and prosperity. So who in your life is enthusiastic? Are there things we can learn from them? Are there things that we can learn not to do from them? Have you seen mistakes where enthusiasm ended up being a negative? Have you evaluated the role of enthusiasm? And remember, these are all words. But really, for a podcast like this, we're using words to understand energy and elements of the cosmic unknown world. Sometimes we have to put words onto it. And the word for today is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm seems to be a key ingredient in creating realities and propelling other people to move along within your realities. It's a very, very powerful force that salesmen use, that politicians use. And at a minimum, you should be aware of it. You should be aware of its power and cultivate it develop it, begin to understand its nature with this subtle signal. And maybe you can begin to affirm that you are enthusiastic in harmony with the divine. 
I am enthusiastic in all ways that work perfectly. I am enthusiastic in the words that I speak. I'm enthusiastic in the ways I use my body. I am enthusiastic in the ways I use my voice. And I emphasize my own enthusiasm inspired by this. I found it to be very similar to Albert Carr's book or AHZ Carr, How to Attract Good Luck that we read on the channel. One of the key elements of good luck is zest acting zestfully. I found a lot of resonance with the word zesty being acting zestfully and acting enthusiastically. Even though these are sort of unknown quantities and there's mysteriousness and confusion in the words, there's a mystery within it that you can explore and it is energetic, positive, inspired, hopeful. There are other words that you can think of. But the key is to make it your intention to develop enthusiasm as a quality within your mind toward your definite chief aim. When you've acted enthusiastically towards things you wanted in the past, it's magnetic. So if you're enthusiastic about something, it's magnetic to the things that you want. So close your eyes and I want you to feel your body entering into a state of enthusiasm and get excited, get excited about something. What's the most excited you've been? Was it maybe a sporting event, a wedding, a family event, a friendship, something amazing, something that got you really excited? Give yourself a signal to remind yourself of the excitement. What does it feel like in your body? How are you breathing? How's your heart beating? Can you feel your heart beating in excitement? Can you, can you feel the excitement? Can you feel the enthusiasm? Remind yourself of this enthusiasm. Give yourself a signal, word, picture, or image in your mind that you can bring this feeling of enthusiasm up into your body. Give this reminder to yourself. It's a secret reminder that you create for yourself. And you can use this to artificially create enthusiasm. Now, sometimes it may not last. You have to do it over and over, or you have to continue to inspire yourself in other, in more important ways. Music is very effective for me in creating enthusiasm. Some theme songs out there that really do it for me, but everybody's going to have some different way to invoke this enthusiastic state. I want you to key in and focus on this enthusiasm and maybe even define it. Maybe there's different kinds of enthusiasm. What are the different kinds of enthusiasm that you can have in your life? Remember, this is like the water on the seed that's been planted in the fertile soil of your subconscious mind. And this enthusiasm is like the sun's light and the water all nourishing your definite chief aim for the reality that you want to create. So invoke this and add this into your general state that you are creating. The feeling is the secret. You must be enthusiastic and grateful. We have these two pinnacles and we'll continue to develop this feeling state so that you can adequately feel it in order to create the reality that you want. Enthusiasm will also inspire you to take the actions that you need beyond just the thought. It's a secret hidden path to prosperity. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And one thing I'm incredibly, incredibly enthusiastic about is my art, which you can find at www.newearth.art I'm sending all the love and light to everyone that's listening imagining an enthusiastically fantastic day for all and welcome to the reality revolution <laughs>